So we've themed this Triple M, which is the monthly members meeting as housing crisis throughout history. We'll be talking about um, just you know, the updates behind the scenes with Fusion, um, and then we'll, we'll speak to this topic afterwards. Um, so this is just a bit of an agenda of what we'll be covering, and I'll just jump right into it. Okay, so we have Secretary Report Owen, please. Uh, sure. Um, so yeah, um, there are different ways of counting the, uh, the population of Fusion. Um, fundamentally, um, the people we need most um, when the Electoral Commission calls and asks, are you indeed a member of the Fusion Party? Um, people willing to say yes, that's um, obviously the best sort of member to have. Um, but anyway, if we measure a nation builder, um, one way of seeing who's active, that sort of thing. So yeah, uh, 1723, we need 1500 people to stay registered. And um, the audit that started a few months ago, um, yeah, it's resumed now that the Fadden by-election has finished. Yeah, so we're good. We've, we've made the required numbers, but the AEC still has to go in and check. So you might expect a call from the AEC. And if they say, are you a member of the Fusion Party? Remember, say yes. <laughs> okay, um, finance. So Michael, as treasurer. Thank you, Saha. Um, so yeah, just a quick note on last month there, I reported our donations at the last meeting as 1679. Um, there are actually quite a few donations that we had at the last minute uh, that Stripe hadn't sent through yet. So those have been added in and bring that brings that total actually to 2325. So that's very nice to see. And uh, yeah, thanks for everyone who has donated uh, at the end. Um, now, just for the June story, uh, it's been a fairly standard month with um, a few. I oh, just back on the previous. One. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's been a yeah pretty standard month with um, a few small donations on top of our monthly recurring ones, and no real specific um, expenses outside of the our usual running costs. So at this point, just at the bottom there, you can see we're at uh, positive by thirty one ninety nine. Um, so then on the next slide, um, following our big lump of annual expenses in the last month. Um, which sort of took us for a big hit, but where uh, there's still a few outstanding transactions in here that it shows, but uh, yeah, we can, you can see that we're sitting at a balance of just above a 2000. So that's plenty for us to be going on with uh, for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, but yeah, that's what we can, um, I can start pumping that up again for, for the, uh, the, the various things we'll have coming up. Uh, yes. And that's our position. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. So that's enough for us to keep, you know, moving, but we'll need some more. Um, so the executive report, um, we have an executive meeting every fortnight. Um, and this is always open to members who can sit in for observation. So that means they can listen in, but you're not able to vote. Um, and the next meeting will be tomorrow. So if you're interested, please email exec at fusionparty.org.au. We'll show you the, the link. Um, we are approaching our second AGM soon. So our last AGM was held uh, between October and November last year. So that means we'll be aiming for that. And then that means that we'll be um, electing potentially a whole new executive. We'll be, the executive positions will be up for election. So more information about the roles involved and how you can apply will be coming very soon. Um, Fusion, uh, as a president of Fusion, it's very, it's a strong, commitment from me to um, be upholding the need for integrity, accountability and transparency just in politics and in government. I think um, we have to walk the talk if we want to see this, um, especially since it was quite a, a pressing and desirable uh, policy point for the federal election. And, you know, we can still see it happening with robo debt and everything that's coming out with IBAC and ICAC. So we'll be having a framework coming soon and that will just um, make Fusion a lot more transparent and accessible. Uh, the vision and the mission. So behind the scenes, we've been working on the vision and the mission to really solidify the identity of Fusion. That's something that always comes up. What do you stand for? What is our big inspiring message? Um, so we have posted those out. Um, it is on our, our party page, just shown at the bottom. Um, but we do have a link to a survey. If you have access to the Discord, you can access this form and you can submit your feedback. Um, but if you don't have access to the Discord, please just email us at exec at fusionparty.org.au. Great. 
So now committee reports, I'm the chair of engagement, so I'll just flow right on. Um, we have a link to an events calendar, which you can have on your Google um, app, and that will just tell you all the events that are coming up, or you can go slash events on our website. Um, we recently kicked off Friday night socials on our Discord. So this is a continuation of what happens on the Pirates Discord. Is there anything you want to mention on this, Miles? Yeah, so at the moment we're running on a fortnightly schedule for Fusion. So that's every second Friday. And um, there's been a really good turnout so far since launching, um, since I launched that a few weeks ago. Most of the attendees have been pirate members, as you said, as a continuation of our existing things. So it's pretty easy to switch over for us. But we have had um been great to see other fusion party members come in uh from, from the branches or from vanilla fusion. And uh as a as a social event, been some good discussions happening around a wide variety of different things. What I'd like to where I'd like to take it in the future is switch it over to more of a um a kickoff point. And so so yes, it'll still effectively be a social event. But we'll pivot towards um, uh, uh, move, moving people towards uh, in, into a general flow in terms of other events. So RSVPing for other events or getting awareness for other events coming up and mm. as a sort of way of soft onboarding in, into the party as well for volunteering roles. Thank you. Yeah. And in real life would be good too. Um, and then also a new member profile podcast. So it's been in my mind to really do a podcast for a while. I've been thinking about doing um, a pol you know, short cast on policy points, things like that. That can still happen, but I think it would be more interesting and more engaging and really put some personality behind who we are by having a new member profile podcast. So I like to um, call people who are new members to the party and just have a chat on board them. Um, and I think from those conversations, we really learn a lot from each other's expertise and perspectives. So I think if anyone is interested, please email me at engagement at fusionparty.org.au um, and we can have a quick chat about having you on the new podcast. Comms. Okay, so Angus couldn't make it tonight, but um, what we do is we have a monthly newsletter um, and we usually release that by the end of the month. So if there's anything that you'd like to contribute to the newsletter, just um, talking about a topic or whatever is just burning there, um, comms at fusionparty.org.au. Um, we'll have a member feedback survey coming out in the next newsletter too because we just want to keep our finger on the pulse there. Um, and then we'll also submit a triple M pitch form. So we're really um, utilising these triple M meetings now um, and we want to use it as a way to educate and inform interesting and, and topical points with our members and the public, especially since we record these and put them onto YouTube and our socials to view. So if there's anything that you really want to help um, with those sessions and to pitch, uh, please contact us for the form. And now Michael. Oh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, just quickly on these. So uh, these are sort of similar points to the previous one. Oh, actually, sorry. Um, yeah, so the first point just on the policy intake form. So as usual, I mentioned before, there's a, uh, we have on the website a, a form where you can submit um, policy requests or suggestions. Uh, that's sort of our general form at the moment, but we are probably looking to change this up a little bit over the next little while. Uh, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, on the voice member question form, uh, Saha, that's sort of a bit of a cross sort of comms and engagement. Do you want to speak to that briefly? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So um, we also sent out a survey in our last newsletter because um, Fusion has been quite, you know, clear about our position on the voice, which is yes, it's been that way since the Fed election in 22, um, supporting the Uluru statement from the heart. Um, but we want to gauge what are some burning questions? Because we know there's a lot of conversation happening out there on both sides, but we want to know from Fusion members what is still outstanding in, in understanding and concerns. So please submit your questions there and that can help tailor our comms and education events in the future. Cool. And um, yeah, thanks, Saha. Um, and yeah, so we are also developing sort of a bit of a, a longer form uh, uh, we sort of mentioned it last month that it was supposed to be we're hoping for it to be out earlier but um we're sort of going through these processes of consultation a little bit as well um so we're hoping to get some um so, sort of longer content out uh just regarding our position sort of fleshing that out a bit more as well it sort of covers looks to cover some of the both the yes and no arguments as best we can from our positions as well so hopefully we can get that out very soon and that'll be pretty useful to you um 
Well, and the next point, just quickly, the policy de development meeting. So every two weeks, we are doing a uh, policy dev workshop on our uh, current uh, detailed policy topic, which is affordable housing. So we're in our third phase of, of our uh, policy development process um, for sort of the long and complex uh, topics, which is on actually exploring the policy implementations. And with this one, we are uh, so, so we're now sort of having looked at the kind of the problem assessment and and working out the outcomes and making sure everyone's on the same page with that. We are now really going to be diving straight right into the the uh, the details of, of of how to get these things done and what what the uh, what the more detailed policy for housing that that Fusion will uh, will be supporting in the next while. So, uh, yeah, our next meeting is on on Wednesday on the ninth. Um, so feel free to join. There's uh, you can you can see the event page on the website as well. Uh, and so you can RSVP to that and that'll, that'll get you the Zoom link in there. Um, so yeah, um, so we'll jump to the next slide. So I've got a few sort of slides on, on here. So this one uh, was going to be Bryony who uh, is unavailable today as well. So I'll keep this one relatively brief. Um, but there is currently some discussions among organizers of various parties regarding a joint climate accord. Now, it's very, very early stages, so this is mostly a watch this space, but we're hoping that this will become a great initiative for both policy development and campaigning. Uh, so just a way for the, some of these groups to collaborate and sort of commit to sort of uh, different kinds of sort of campaigning and supporting each other in some of these messages. Uh, so yeah, we'll uh, update you on this as soon as there is more to share. Uh, and that's, that'll be sort of, but that's, that's, that's about all we can really share on that at this point. Um, so now, um, uh, alongside the housing policy, uh, which we'll have a little bit more on later, but um, and as a new step in the recent visioning work that's been done, uh, the PDC is now working on a full review of the policy platform to update and expand on it. So if we jump to the next slide, um, pretty boring slides I have, but... Um, the so while the existing policy has some minor tweaks on occasion it's still roughly the same as what was produced in the initial merging of the parties to create fusions platform so there's certainly a need to progress this faster now our current platform is organized into a few broad based sort of broad categories that candidates could choose as their primary campaign issues for example sort of climate emergency and future focused uh, those were headings that uh, often appeared on a lot of campaign flyers and, and their camp and the campaign pages. Uh, but uh, and, and and the policies themselves that we have also have very sort of different levels of specificity when it comes to implementation. So some of them are broad inspirational goals like 800% renewables, while others are uh, specific legislative changes that we support, such as a tax on carbon. And they're all kind of just jumped in, bunched into the same places and. Uh, into the into the one place. So we have a few overarching goals for this work that we're looking to undertake. Um, the first is just to update ex the existing policies and, and get things up to date. Second is to fill gaps uh, on the important issues where they exist. So find them and, 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 and sort of fill them in. And the next is uh, to organize this platform better as it grows. So we wanna make sure it is easier to work with and maintain. Uh, but also improve how it's presented and can be understood by uh, by members and uh, campaigners and candidates. So building talking points and and being able to really uh, share and uh, promote this platform. So if we jump to the next slide, uh, so there so there might be different ways that we can present them on our website or in campaign material and stuff like that. But uh, we plan to start organizing our policy based on ministerial portfolios, such as health and aged care, uh, climate change and energy, et cetera. Um, in the short term, this should help us identify existing gaps we want to fill. But in the long term, we want to empower spokespeople in these departments. And we, at some point, might want to call them shadow ministers or something like that. Uh, so we're also working with what we're going to call this for now, but, um, but what, we're, what we're calling right now is uh, policy position statements. Now, these are one to two paragraph statements that apply our values and principles to the reality of these areas. And while it 
might touch on specific implementations. These will be mostly aspirational, uh, focusing on desired outcomes. Uh, our more detailed policy that we have uh, can flow on from these positions. And we do want to try to support multiple ways of grouping these policies and be flexible. Uh, but this is where, what we're planning to do in terms of sort of organizing and uh, making sure we can kind of really work on and expand this out uh, and make sure, make sure they're really usable. So we want to have position statements for every policy area. Uh, so all of these sort of portfolios within the next couple of months. That's our, that's our goal. Um, and so lastly, just wanted to share the PDC plan on this for the next month or two. So uh, we'll start by formatting the existing policy under this structure, and we're going to identify gaps and prioritize which areas should be addressed first. So the survey we sent a while back uh, and the intake form that we guys have been sending through will help us a lot with that. And uh, we'll then provide one or two of these statements that can be used like a guide or a template. And we want to make sure that you guys can get involved via workshops and submissions. So we'll we'll definitely be keeping you uh, informed as to when those are happening. And we're hoping to be able to start kicking that off in the next few weeks. Um, and just a final call out there that uh, there are a few submissions we received via the intake forms, and we'll certainly be using those for this. And we'll also be trying to reach out to you directly to chat about the topics you've raised and, and make sure we can, uh, there might be more information we want to get or you can ways, ways you can get involved closer. Um, and lastly, we are also considering some technical solutions to, for organizing and presenting the policies. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, please get in touch. Um, so I know that was sort of a lot of a, a bit of an info dump. Um, so I'm happy to take questions there. Um, otherwise, yeah, feel free to contact us as usual at uh, policy at fusionparty.org.au. Any questions? Or anything from before, because I know we were uh, raced through it. Uh, Michael, I was just going to say, um, I, I like that idea of the, you know, the shadow ministers for things. Although, um, did you guys remember um, after Anzac Day, um, you know, Tim Wilson, he was voted out of his seat, and um, for some reason, like the the new member couldn't be there. So um, Tim Wilson, acting as um, shadow member for his electorate, turned up and um, shut those people out of the way and put his own wreath there as the uh, official representative for the electorate. <laughs> I just hope we, uh, we don't go down that path, yeah. I mean, I feel like that's just a conduct thing, but um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, the, the shadow minister ideally is that, I mean, if we have a spokesperson on someone, that would be the ideally the person that uh, we would be saying that we're, we're confident that that person can represent that portfolio in, in government. So we'd want to make sure that that person is uh, obviously well versed in, in those policy topics, uh, but uh, that is sort of passionate and willing to work on that sort of to sort of do that work as well. So, I mean, the, a, a shadow minister is what um, you'll see the, the opposition and, uh, and Greens call their spokespeople a lot, most of the time. And so ideally, that's what we, we want to be striving for. Mm. Um, Miles? Yeah, thanks. Um, there was, I love the little implication you had there at the end, Michael, where it was like Greens and Labour call them shadow ministers. So I'm kind of thinking now, what would we call ours if we don't call them shadow ministers? <laughs> what, what, uh, what's some kind of terminology we could use that would sort of get across our, our ideas and our ways of thinking that differentiates us there? Um, I just wanted to say a uh, great idea. We were kind of talking about something similar during the federal election. And um, maybe that's where the inspiration came from. And I'd uh, love to see it happen. We did, um, I have put together, uh, I've ran media trainings. Um, I first put that together during the Aston by-election for Owen. And I've sort of pulled that out and written that up as a doc. So that's um, that's uh, some, some guides we've got there, which we can run through. And um, I'm pretty keen to run those more generally soon. And two sort of variations of that that I want to do are, um, a, a a candidate sort of a candidate workshop on how to and what it's like to be a candidate, but then also specific media based training. Um, so, the, given that we are a, a small party, I think that um, this is more of a comment than a question. But I, I think that while it'd be great to have people or subject matter experts and, and qualified in each field, the the reality is that it'll be very hard to sort of find those people. And but then ones who can also sort of align neatly with um the, the the kind of things that we do want to see in the future so 
uh, I think it comes down to to candidates and effective ways that we can sort of find candidates and find people to step forward and fill those roles. So um, my question then is, do you do you do you see a nice way to uh, uh, to to reach out and bring more people into, um, or rather get more people to step up as spokesperson or as candidate to start taking up these roles? Um, yeah, I mean, I think so. On, on um, oh, I've got. Uh, didn't actually notice my my type of there. Um, I, so we do have. Um, uh, sorry, on your, sorry, on your comment of 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 like it's yeah, it's definitely hard to get to people sort of people uh, spokes uh, spokespeople dedicated on a particular topic and things like that. And um, yeah, I, I think doing media training and and all these kinds of things would be really good. But I think the one of the biggest roadblocks to that is just limited content. Um, so uh, the if if the policy content is minimal um if it's vague if we don't have um if there's not a much not much to go on there uh the a potential candidate or spokesperson has to do a lot of work to uh be able to uh just either catch themselves up or to res just responding to any particular events so i think the first steps really are just to expand this uh expand these platforms so again i think closing sort of um Finding and 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 filling the gaps in the platform in general um, is 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 I think is really is our best first step, just to make sure that we do have overall positions on things that we maybe have been a bit more silent on recently, and then from that fleshing that out into more detailed policy. So our goal is I mean the PDC is um, is is small uh, and we're mostly supposed to uh, our job is mostly to sort of facilitate this uh, a lot of this work. So we need more people to sort of jump in and, and get involved, but we need to make it easier for them to do so. So I, th I think to answer your question, mostly, I think the path forward to, to, to getting getting that, so getting more uh, candidates and getting more uh, potential spokesmen, uh, spokespeople, is really to uh, expand the policy platform so that there is more to work with. And it was just overall, I think. Nice. All right, great. So we are on to the next part, which is housing crisis through history. So Owen, please. Oh yeah, so um, Angus was helping me research this as well. Um, Angus is our comms chair. Um, but yeah, basically with, um, you know, uh, this being still a hot topic, you know, people need a place to live. Um, then um, yeah, I guess, you know, we need to understand history properly to avoid repeating it. Um, and I'll go, I have to be very careful with my words here because we'll be touching on some, um, you know, difficult topics. Um, and so, yeah, Michael from the policy committee will hopefully be able to um, pull me up if I say the wrong thing. Um, at the end of each slide, uh, for each example, um, feel free to jump in with some questions. Um, and then at the end, we'll be a bit more prescriptive about um, how we avoid these sorts of crises and, um, yeah, another opportunity for questions. Um, but yeah, uh, so uh, let's get going. Great. So yeah, um, Kowloon Wall City, this place is on the outskirts of Hong Kong. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar, but um, why Hong Kong was a British protectorate, uh, if that's the right word, for many years. Um, in the, basically, Britain was importing a lot of goods from China um, and that trade imbalance was causing Britain to be poor. Um, so they needed something to sell to China. Um, and they, uh, I think they sort of chose opium is going to be what they would force on the, the Chinese people um, through India. Um, anyway, China tried banning the opium because, um, you know, everybody was becoming addicted and, you know, wasn't good for society. Um, but in order to keep the opium still flowing, the British sent their navy to Hong Kong and started the first opium war. There were two opium wars. And so um, the Chinese lost Hong Kong, but there was this fortress that managed to survive, uh, Kowloon Walled City. Um, anyway, so, you know, it, it was gonna get handed back to um, Britain in 99. Um, but in, uh, so after Japan invaded at the start of World War II, um, that's when it lost the walls. Uh, the walls were repurposed into airfields, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, as the pictures you see here, um, the city grew to a population of 33,000 people 
in 97. Um, and since it was, you know, still Chinese territory uh, during all that time, that's basically how it developed into this sort of den of mischievousness, um, this sort of, you know, black market city where the police were very reluctant to visit because, um, you know, if you're going to honour the sovereignty of China, then, you know, Hong Kong police can't really go in this place. Um, so the policing there was, you know, once in a while they would go in to arrest some drug kingpins, that sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, in the absence of any government here, with it being such a hands-off approach, um, you know, not many people actually paid for power, for instance. You would, you know, hook in a connection to somebody else's power line um, in between the buildings. People would just throw a whole bunch of rubbish. Uh, I don't know if you can quite see in this, um, if you can imagine looking down from above, there was one atrium where they still had one of the old buildings uh, that was originally there. But otherwise, um, yeah, you would be extremely lucky to have a window in this place. Um, and so uh, you'll see how the, the height is sort of maxed out at 14 stories because it's close to an airport. Uh, I'm not quite sure how they um, managed to enforce that. Um, but yes, yeah, so the city was controlled by the triads. Um, lots of the money was from you know, illegal activity, um, opium, that sort of thing. Um, people were operating factories inside. Um, I'm sure you can imagine that the air quality would have been terrible. And you'll see um, it still exists in you know, films, um, in sort of pop culture. If you imagine some sort of, you know, um, I guess like sort of like Neo Tokyo, but um, more grungy and criminal and, you know, with the, um, the aircraft flying close by, um, you'll see, you know, instances of this in uh, Batman Begins. Uh, Call of Duty Black Ops. Um, anyway, as you can probably guess, it was torn down um, once it was handed back to China because uh, who would want that? Anyway, um, I, I guess it's worth noting as well that um, we could interpret this as a situation of like, do we ever need a government? Because, you know, the government was hands off here and yet look, 14 stories didn't fall down, not a good way to live, but um, something to consider. Anyway, um, yeah, so uh, let's move on to... Um, perhaps an even worse place to live. Um, I, I think this, we'll see, this won't be the worst place to live in the talk. But um, so La Vela is Scambia. This is on the outskirts of Naples. Um, and I guess, you know, Scambia is still a real place. Um, you'll see this in um, this fantastic movie, Gomorrah, if you guys ever get a chance to watch. Um, basically, uh, so this place was established in 1962. Um, unfortunately, the builders cut corners, there was lots of corruption. Uh, so you'll see this guy, for instance, standing on the balcony. Um, you know, this balcony was meant to be like a, you know, visually appealing. It was meant to be like a relaxing sort of um, community going on here. But, um, you know, for, they weren't meant to use this particular concrete, for instance, which, you know, stains easily, looks ugly. Um, they didn't end up building a whole bunch of the communal areas that they were supposed to. Uh, people didn't end up looking after the gardens like they were supposed to do. Um, at the end, you know, funding was running out. So they built some apartments with no electricity and even no toilets. Um, so, you know, obviously like it turned into a place where nobody really wanted to live. Um, the worst part of it is perhaps after there was, um, there was a big earthquake in Italy in um, just trying to find, I think it was 1980, the earthquake happened. Um, and so then a whole bunch of squatters moved in. Um, the place became even worse. And so then it was around that time, uh, the mafia decided to get involved, the Nuovo Camorra Organizita, uh, so the Camorra. Um, and yeah, under the Camorra, this place became the heroin capital of Europe. Um, the police were reluctant to go in. Um, the police station was only built there in 1987. And I guess it's worth noting as well that besides these eight sales, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention La Belle is the sales. So uh, you can see it sort of looks like a sale. Um, so there was one of the sales never got built. And as I said, the communal areas didn't end up getting built. Um, and so the surrounding buildings, you know, hospitals, schools, that sort of thing, obviously didn't get built either. So this place was, um, you wouldn't want to live there. And so then uh, in 2003, 
the unemployment rate amongst these people was 61%. And um, then the next year, the Scampia feud kicked off where people were being murdered pretty much every day. Uh, this was sort of like, um, you know, the gangs, the gangs were out in the war there. Um, it's worth noting that um, part of the reason this place could, I guess, succeed as um, sort of the, the headquarters of the Kimura family was because, like, if you look at these designs, you know, the balconies and um, the sails overlooking each other, and as well, even um, outside the apartments, like on the outside, there was a balcony running across, um, instead of, you know, instead of your window being on the edge of the building, there was a like a, a walkway on the edge of the building. So all this contributed to, um, if the cops were gonna to come in the apartment buildings, um, you could easily have scouts who would tell you that they're coming and you could easily run away. So that's basically how this um, lived on as the heroin capital of Europe. Um, but yeah, so there's the, the movie, there's a, a TV show, um, which anyway, the, the movie's great if you guys get a chance to watch it. So um, I guess we can ask ourselves, um, what can we learn from this lesson? Um, I guess this sort of building is what many people imagine when you tell them about public housing. Um, and I guess I would give the, the lesson, um, if we're going to build public housing, um, make sure we just don't do it like this. Um, don't let them cut corners, that sort of thing. Um, anyway, how do, uh, I, I was gonna mention as well, like what if we had um, more robots involved in the building process instead of corruptible builders? Um, although <laughs> Brownie from the EDC uh, doesn't like the solution to everything being robots. <laughs> anyway, yeah. any questions about this before? Now let's move on. Okay. Um, yeah, I, mean, I was just going to make a comment. I mean, it, from sort of bringing it back to um, sort of more contemporary things and, and the sort of like the interesting part of this, of looking at this is um, sort of looking how it, uh, obviously, some of these, and I, I think there's, you said there's more uh coming that are worse but um these and so i mean these you think these are pretty extreme and you totally we'd never get anywhere th like this in australia but there are some sort of concerning parallels when you when you talk about um both the last one and this one with uh comparing to sort of certain situations of social housing in australia there are plenty of stories that come across where uh people do uh, are afraid to live there um mm. the, the 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 places where you just have high concentrations of um where it's just or it's just only social housing um the, the these these are not simple issues to deal with but the it should be pretty obvious that just dumping people into one place uh in, in a concentrated place and then just not doing anything else is is probably not a good way to is, is, is not enough to be looking after these people yeah as well um Oh, I was going to, I see the parallels as well. Like what if San Francisco becomes like this or um, oh, what else? Sorry, there, there was another way of avoiding this. Um, but, oh yeah, sorry. There was, I think it was in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, where um, he's talking about public housing in the US. And there was a situation where um, some of the buildings in the same estate were split off and managed by different groups. And for one building, they decided that, um, like nobody was really looking after the grass or something. So they decided to just replace it with concrete versus the other building decided that they would put some effort in and look after the grass. And that was pretty much the only physical difference between the buildings. And yet um, the building with the grass ended up having less antisocial behavior. Um, yeah, just some grass instead of concrete. And so, you know, that's um, why I mentioned, for instance, you know, the, the ugly concrete in this building. Plus, um, in the comments, some people were saying stuff along the lines of like, why did they build this for these people? They should be forced to live in it themselves. Um, but the architect, for instance, he died in 77. Um, and also, I think, you know, what I would say to these people is the architect didn't plan it to be like this. The builders cut corners, the builders were corrupt. Um, if people just follow the plans of architects and engineers, wouldn't we have a fantastic world? It reminds me of um, broken windows theory. Yes, yes. Yeah. So when it looks like it's dilapidated or no one's taking care of it, it just sends that signal of, well, no one's watching this. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, um, this is uh, this place is still too positive. We'll move on to even worse place to live. So <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm sure um, many people have heard of the Rwandan genocide. 
um, which mainly took place in 1993, I believe, sorry, 1994. Um, anyway, so to set the backstory, um, the Germans uh, colonized a place that they called East Africa, which is sort of Rwanda and Burundi here. But um, after World War I, um, you know, they lost and it was taken off their hands. Um, it was split up into Rwanda and Burundi. And then it was, um, Rwanda was handed to the um, Belgium. Yeah, because uh, I guess, you know, Belgium has such a track record of um, looking after colonies. <laughs> anyway, what's important to note as well, um, so the clash was between the, the Hutus and the Tutsis. Um, so Hutu pretty much means peasant and Tutsis translates as nobles. Um, and it's worth noting that these people weren't ethnically different. They spoke the same language, they had, you know, the same culture, essentially. Um, the Tutsis, the nobles, they were taller and they had fairer skin, but that was because of their lifestyle. That wasn't because of their genetics. Um, you know, if you're not going to work the land, that sort of thing, then, you know, you, you won't have as much of a tan and, you know, you'll be thinner, that sort of thing, um, more protein. So anyway, um, when the Belgians took charge after World War I, um, part of the way they helped sort of keep power was to keep, you know, the locals happy um, and, you know, keeping the Tutsis on their side. So already there was this imbalance that the Tutsis are basically landowners and don't do as much physical labour. The Belgians sort of went further on that and they were doing, um, I think it's called chronology, you know, you measure the skulls and like, try to work out, you know, what are these biological differences that make these people different? Well, you know, th there weren't any, as I said, they were the same, the same people, just classes. Um, anyway, so then um, in 1961, um, oh, sorry, so after the Second World War, the UN ruled that um, they couldn't continue this, um, you know, sort of caste or classist system and that they had to have proper democracy. Um, and, you know, obviously that meant the Hutus would, they were going to come to power. Uh, the Tutsis were obviously worried about payback, um, which um, you'll see they had every reason to be concerned. Um, anyway, um, so then there started, um, people started getting armed. Um, then there was uh, a Belgian military intervention in 1961. They said that there were going to be um, a referendum and elections. Um, so then um, Tutsis started fleeing to, um, you see Burundi to the south and Uganda to the north. Um, then uh, in 1972, was the first genocide. This was actually in Burundi. So 200,000 people died in that genocide. Um, they were Hutus mainly, um, especially the educated people um, who you know, could challenge the government. Um, and the, so the Tutsis took hold in Burundi as the government. Um, then a Hutu general took control of Rwanda um, and he implemented a one party state you know, this was despite the UN wanting, you know, proper democracy. Um, and so, you know, this sort of conflict went on for a while. Eventually, the one party state introduced a second party. Uh, they sorry, sort of allowed the second party to start. Um, the second party was led by the wife of the, um, the military leader who was running the place. But um, it, it sounds as though it was a sincere opposition party. Like, she wasn't just... Um, you know, a sort of placeholder. She did actually have, you know, slightly different views to her husband. Um, anyway, um, so these people, um, the people in Uganda, there started to be uh, what's known as the Bush War, which was led, uh, oh, sorry, it involved the Tutsis, um, including a guy, Kagame, who will come up again later in the story. But anyway, so the, the when I mentioned the wife's party, uh, she called that the Akuzu. And her premise was basically that um, the, the Hutus, who remember were in control, um, she was saying that they should carry out retribution against all the years of Tutsi rule. Um, and that, you know, the leading party was being too nice to the Tutsis. Um, they should all be killed as retribution. Anyway, so she created the Thousand Hills Free Radio 
which, um, you know, the name is, you know, obviously misleading, like all these military ones are, the, the radio station was about how much we hate Tootsies and how, how we should kill Tootsies. Um, anyway, so then uh, everything really came to a head in 1994. Uh, the president's plane was shot down by a missile launcher. Um, and so then uh, Bagasora, who was leading one of the um, anti-Tootsie groups within Rwanda, um, he formed a crisis committee, which was, you know, a coup to take government. Um, his, anyway. And then um, the, the free radio station released a signal, um, cut the tall trees. And um, oh, I forgot to mention before that, actually. So this guy, Bagasora, in the picture, so he was on the Hutu side. He was one of the ones who wanted payback against the Tutsis. Um, they had been trying to do the peace accords, but um, he left the peace accords and said, quote, unquote, he was going to prepare for the apocalypse. And so, yeah, after he started his preparations, that's when the plane was shot down, um, the crisis committee was formed and the signal went out to cut the tall trees, which meant um, the militia all got machetes and let loose, started killing the Tutsis. Um, over a hundred days, there were 200, no, sorry, 800,000 Tutsis were killed. Um, many more people fled. Um, to the west of this picture. It was called Zaire at the time. It's now the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, and so, yeah, I guess any guesses as to who won the Civil War? Um, anyway, I guess some people probably know, but the, the Tutsis won the Civil War. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, you know, Tutsi rule was reestablished after all these years of the interfering in the UN, if you look at it from that perspective. Um, and funnily enough, um, the Kagame, who was involved in the Bush War, he is the current president of Rwanda. Um, so yeah, I guess, you know, the conclusions we can make, um, I, I would say that, you know, as we mentioned, I don't really consider it to be a genocide in the sense of like, you know, there was no sterilization, there was no um, removal of culture, these people were biologically the same anyway. Um, to me, it seems like a better characterization would be that this was class warfare. Um, and that basically, you know, the, and how, how can you quickly transition into equality? Obviously, like the people who are rich, the people who stand to lose something in this move to equality are going to violently resist it. And, you know, in this case, um, they managed to come back to power once we tried to move to equality. Um, I guess it's also worth noting that, um, I don't know, can we say that maybe like that is their culture, like the, the split between the Tutsis and the Hutus, as much as we don't like it from a Western equality point of view, like that was their culture. And um, I guess, yeah, it, you know, couldn't, couldn't take on. Um, anyway, Michael, I don't know if you have any more pres prescriptive notes about this conflict. Um, I mean, this one's a little harder for me to uh, sort of link back to the sort of Australian situation and and, and our policy dev and stuff like that. Um, I mean, there are certain things with, uh, I, I, I guess, if there is if there are changes that we need to make, if there are, um, I guess, I don't know if you I don't know if you were implying this, but if there were sort of maybe certain changes we need to make with land or uh, sort of sort of societal changes that we're going mm -hmm. to need in order to uh, kind of move ourselves in a particular direction. Um, it's obviously important to understand the potential sort of implications and, and all the different kinds of stakeholders in, in these things, uh, what kind of pushback you might get on certain things. But yeah, I, I mean, this, this one was obviously a very uh, uh, specific uh, historical example, a sort of geopolitical example. So it's a um it's it's a yeah it's probably a harder one for i don't i don't have as many th much yeah. else to actually I, I wanted to mention as well that um you know partly why um also so when the 100 days of um you know quote unquote genocide started um so the main i, I, I should mention the main people killed in that genocide were the tutsis killed within rwanda versus the hutus fled to zaire and i guess the reason the Tutsis sort of stayed and died was because, you know, their wealth was in their property. They couldn't just pick it up and run. And so um, 
one of the takeaways I wanted to emphasize was that, um, you know, having all your wealth stored as just property um, can be problematic. And you see, for instance, you know, climate change at the moment, if your property is tied up in, you know, houses on a cliff top on the edge of the sea, then, you know, might come back to bite you. Um, and also, I wanted to emphasize that um, if we let our society become such a class-based society, then how is it ever supposed to end? If we ever try to, you know, have equality, then it could lead to, you know, violent conflict like this. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the violent conflicts at the end. There's um, two more examples I was hoping to get to quickly, Saha. Uh, okay. Um, so this place, uh, Terry Garwal in, um, in the Himalayas, it's part of India. Um, the name translates as, um, I think it was Terry means um, place to wash your sins. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah. The sins of thought, word and deed. Uh, Garwal is a fort. But um, I don't know if this rates as bad as the genocide, but comparable. Um, so in David Graeber's book, Debt, the first 3,000 years, I think he calls it. Um, so he talks about, um, I'll read out a bit of a quote, um, French anthropologist Jean-Claude Gailly encountered in a region of the Eastern Himalayas, um, I looked at the references, he's talking about this place, um, the low ranking castes in a situation of permanent debt dependency. It was common practice Gailey explains, for high caste moneylenders to demand of the borrower's daughters as security. Often when a poor man had to borrow money for his daughter's marriage, the security would be the bride herself. She would be expected to report to the lender's household after her wedding night, spend a few months there as his concubine, and then once he grew bored, she'd be sent off to some nearby timber mill, work as a prostitute there for a year or two, and then finally, once the debt was repaid, she could come back and join her husband. Um, I think even, you know, even like with this situation being so messed up, um, I wanted to mention as well that the anthropologist, um, he reports that these people didn't even see it as a big injustice. They just thought of it as like, this is just the way things work. Um, although I should mention, um, Rani wanted to call attention to, you know, maybe these people were too scared to say anything. Maybe they didn't um, see it as just the way the world works. But anyway, that's that's what the anthropologist reported. Um, and yeah, just as well, this doesn't happen in Australia, or as far as I'm aware. But um, anyway. Uh, but yeah, uh, last example, so, huh? Um, so yeah, the Industrial Revolution. So um, this was mainly Angus's research. Thank you, Angus, if you're watching this later. Um, so yeah, I guess the, in the Industrial Revolution, we can't really point to one specific housing crisis. Um, you know, conditions were bad. And you'll see like on old buildings, for instance, like these ones in New York, you'll see um, the steps up to the, up to the entrance with the poor door underneath for the servants' quarters. Um, part of the reason, like, you know, why couldn't the entrance just be on street level? Um, at the time, there was the miasma theory where bad air sort of floated along the streets um, and you didn't want that getting into your house. So you would build a few steps up. Also just the view. I mean, if you look down, I think this is Trafalgar Square in London below. Um, and if you can imagine all these horses, you know, walking around, you know, you can see this is just mud. So, you know, mud and horse manure. Um, yeah, you, you didn't really want to look out on that. You wanted more of like an aerial view, I guess. So um, anyway, but coincidentally, uh, even though the miasma theory wasn't true, um, in all the efforts to sort of rearrange society, rearrange architecture to deal with this bad air, they did end up coincidentally solving cholera, all these sorts of sewage related diseases. Um, and you'll see, um, you know, some of what characterizes the housing situation in the Industrial Revolution is, you know, the smog, uh, the poor houses, where basically you would work doing menial labor, but you would also get a place to live. Um, similar to, um, what, is that Oliver Twist? Is that his name? Oliver someone. Remember the, the music? Anyway, that's, that's pretty accurate, I think. Um, it wasn't in Angus's notes. Anyway, um, but yeah, all these issues, you might think, well, how come, you know, there was no sort of violent uprising or anything um, during the Industrial Revolution? Uh, if we move to the next slides, are. 
then um, so in the in the book why nations fail the argument is that oh thank thanks guys but anyway um, if we think of why nations fail um, the takeaway from the book is nations fail because they haven't had a revolution or you know enough revolutions um, and so when we think of you know the French Revolution or on the right we see the glorious revolution in England um, what kicked that off was um, King James II dismissed Parliament and wanted to rule, um, you know, by his own whims. Uh, so they wrote in his son-in-law, who was ruling uh, the Netherlands at the time. Um, they asked him, please invade and kick out our king and you'll become the new ruler. Um, and, you know, this idea was so popular that it became known as the bloodless revolution. King James just fled. Um, and so the book very much makes the case that in order to, um, if we keep pursuing democracy in like its purest form, then um, one of the things it does is like, if you have a chance to succeed, you're not going to be worried about, you know, sort of gatekeepers stopping you or taking a cut. Um, if you come up with a great idea, a great business or whatever, you can reap the rewards of all your work. Um, and so if you have in very powerful incumbents, they, they knew how to win the current set of rules. They knew how to win the current game. And so they don't want the rules to change. So for instance, when the printing press was invented, it didn't really take hold in Turkey. They said, if you want the printing press, you have to get our approval um, it has to be like good Muslim books, that sort of thing. Um, and I think there was a quote along the lines of like, why, why do you need to print anything besides the Quran? Um, I might be mixing up my stories, sorry. But um, either way, the printing press wasn't really approved in Turkey um, because basically like, why would you want other people challenging your authority? You might lose. And so the way this plays out in Australia at the moment, even though we have many good things about a democracy, the power, there's still undeniable power in being the incumbent government. Um, you'll see the way the media reports on it, and even the way Wikipedia reports on it, is that the incumbent government is probably going to win the next election. Maybe there's one other party that will challenge them, but for all the other parties, like, ah, uh, don't really need to consider them. Um, so I would say, you know, to any viewers, if you ever talk about an upcoming election, and you start predicting the future, I mean, you know, ABC News or Wikipedia, well, if they say like, here are the most important candidates, you know, before the vote has happened, then it kicks off this sort of feedback cycle where like, if you say this candidate doesn't really exist, then, you know, the voters will never see them. Um, you know, it, it, it permeates and, you know, then the person doesn't end up getting elected and then, you know, Wikipedia and ABC say, like, see, we were right. This person wasn't going to be elected. Like, yeah, you just sort of forced it to happen. Anyway, um, if we, the point is we need to keep equality uh, and it's hard to keep equality. Um, and the only way, if it gets off course, the only way to bring it back is through revolution. And so that's why um, I guess the only way that we can, you know, the only way that there would be equality in Rwanda, I feel, is if there was another revolution. I don't think we can just, you know, pray that it will happen. Um, you know, with the Tutsis in charge of Rwanda, um, I would predict actually what's going to happen in the future is that the Tutsis keep exploiting Rwanda or there's a revolution to overthrow them, um, which would, you know, be classed as another genocide. So, um, yeah, on that note, um, let's, uh, let's end the housing speech. Thank you, um, Owen. And yes, and you're, you're not inciting violence or a revolution, you're just recounting <laughs> history. <laughs> so that was um, really cool, really interesting. So yeah, thanks for putting that together. Um, so that takes us to our final slide, saying that if you want to see what Fusion is organizing for future events, just make sure you go to our website slash events. Next Triple M will be um, September 6th. So it's always the first Wednesday of the month. Um, and if you would like to pitch a topic, just like Owen had presented tonight, um, 
make sure you email us at comms at fusionparty.org.au and we'll send you the triple M pitch form. And ideally that would be sent to us before the middle of the month so we can organize communications and, and all of that for the next triple M. So thanks. And wow, we made really good time. We have four minutes left. Um, anything anyone wants to ask or talk about since all of that? Um, I, I mean, I'm just to comment on, on um, Owen's topic. I mean, I, I'm certainly keen to look more into historical examples of uh, instead of ways that can inform our policy development and, and understand the current situations. I think there's a lot of examples that can really demonstrate just how complex certain issues are because um, we're not just wanting to make housing affordable. We want to make housing that is adequate for the people who live there and actually you sort of use that land productively so you can't we can't just be dumping a, a ton of money into something or making everything something, something very very cheap so that a whole bunch of houses are built if those houses are either it's going to be a huge amount of urban sprawl that has to clear away a lot of native forest and or it's going to be this sort of uh i'm, I'm very much for high density but high density in uh, in places where there is good planning, where there's, as we said, good, good green spaces, access to services and things like that. So um, it is, there's, there's a lot of complexity in trying to make, uh, trying, trying to get this to, to, to work in the existing situation. Uh, but that's the thing we're working on. And um, uh, we're, yeah, we're keen to get your involvement on the, uh, the next uh, uh, work, working meeting um, next Wednesday. Um, or otherwise, again, shoot us some stuff on that uh, policy at uh, fusionparty.org.au. Nice, thanks. And Austin, you have a question? It's more of a, it's more of a comment. I'm, I'm really struggling to see the relevance of these examples to the housing issues in Australia. What I would suggest is that the housing issues in Australia are common of developed nations like Australia, the other the comparable places would be would be Canada. Although Hong Kong, not Kowloon City, but the nice part of Hong Kong, the the, the regular part has mm -hmm. a similar issue of massively overpriced housing. Um, I would also just quickly point out that I think we need to take a breath before we assume that the issue is, oh, uh, there's not enough houses. We need to build more supply because the numbers don't actually back that up. What's going on is manipulation of the credit market. Mm -hmm to which is it's it's the availability of credit which is leading to um uh inflated demand from speculators and people buying second homes and people buying bigger homes than they otherwise would etc um because of abnormal credit conditions and i really i mean i'm, I'm pitching uh for the next members meeting to try and present a take that focuses on what i think are the economic drivers and the, the relationship between neoliberalism and house price appreciation, um, which I, I, I think might have more uh, relevance in terms of the actual problems Australia faces with housing. Oh, I, uh, Austin, I don't really agree that the examples aren't relevant at all. Um, I, I should just point out, um, so in the case of the, you know, the, the bride as the debt, and also in the case of the genocide, um, my point there was if we, so as house prices keep getting more expensive in Australia, logically um, you need sort of inheritance as your only way of ever being able to afford a house and so then um you, know, you, you, it, it you think house down. prices are going to keep going up relative to wages uh, i mean they've been doing that since the 80s yeah which is when which is when interest rates were really high and since the 80s interest rates have been coming down and that's been the Ooh. process that's been driving them yeah as but the like either way you, you, asset you prices can see across the, the board going up. right so the, the, that would be a product of, of policy decisions about wages and trade, right? So we, we shouldn't be saying, oh, well, house prices are going to go up, so we've got to then deal with that. We should be saying, what can we do to prevent house prices going up? What are the drivers of house prices going up? And that should be data-driven. Um, yes. And well, like, we, sure, we can have that policy. But I, I, I wanted to make the point as well, like, let's just say fusion doesn't come to power just yet. We can predict that house prices are going to keep increasing for a long time. And then I don't my, think that's the case. I think so, they're going to start. I'm just, I just don't think that's accurate. And I, I think you're just making a, a casual sort of folk politics assumption and that shouldn't be how we make policy. So I'll, I'll just, I'll just step in there if I can. So, um, so the, yeah, so the, the general understanding at the moment, there's a few, there's a few different things there. Um, so firstly, at the moment, house prices in general have been sort of stagnating to a degree. 
Um, there is a lot of like sort of level, the, the certain level in certain areas going up in certain areas and going down in certain areas. There's a lot of uh, expectation. There's a high chance that um, there is a lot of sort of panic selling incoming as interest rates continue to go up. Uh, there's, there is certain risk of um, sort of significant uh, price decreases, in which case there are potential- Is that a risk or uh, is that a good thing? Uh, I mean, by risk, I just mean a, a, a probability. Uh, but in that case, there is uh, there while there are there's like there's a likelihood that uh, house prices need to go down in order to uh, deal with this issue. Uh, it's very important to be considering what the actual implications of that are. So uh, as house prices go down, the, the various economic impacts that has on things like uh, super and uh, retirement and, and various kinds of in other investment vehicles, there are. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at specifically is that uh, while we Damage. need to make sure that investments in housing that is sort of not super productive uh, does, it needs to be routed to other places. Uh, it needs to go somewhere that is more productive, that is better for society and the economy. Um, it, those, the, the places for it to go are limited. Um, it's not that there are I, none. I just want to say one but... thing really quickly about this idea that people are going to be harmed by house prices falling. People were harmed by overpaying for house prices. That's when the damage occurred. When house, when people overpay, that's the damage. That's the harm. When people take on too much debt, which has already happened, that's the scam. When prices go back to normal, that's a good thing. Uh, I mean, there, there, there is, again, it's likely going to be good uh, from it, but it's irresponsible to look at, to, to, to ignore that there could be any sort of negative impacts from that as well. We should be looking at, uh, we should be just understanding the situation and uh, as best as we can to understand what would happen. And yeah, again, the, there's, it's most likely that uh, good housing policy will require the, the lowering of prices uh, or will, will it result in, in lower prices. Uh, but we need to make sure that we are looking at that. Um, we were sort of, we are considering all of those aspects. Yeah, um, I just want to quick step in. So now the formal part of the triple M is done. So no obligation to stay around, but if you want to stick around and chat, go for it. And we've got um, Sundance with his hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say that